week nine. Today's topic is going to be on security. And by security, what I mean really is we're gonna look at just some of the common or well-known attack scenarios that come up in blockchain systems or that come up in this idea of a distributed, open, permissionless ledger to keep track of. So it's not necessarily security in like the uh, IT security sense, uh, although there is some overlap to that as well, right? If you can keep your digital property or if you can keep your digital information secure, then that also applies in blockchain land. So just a quick recap of what we talked about last week. So we had this trade-off here, this intersection between privacy, between security, and between anonymity. And we kind of defined a few of the scenarios in these overlapping bubbles. In the security bubble here, we said like classic example of things being secure is you can just put it in the bank vault. And if you don't like the centralized nature of the bank vault, uh, then you can you know, manage that security yourself. Uh, you know, the DIY version, which is probably going to cost you a lot more than outsourcing it to a, a professional. We had a definition, a quick definition of security. You know, what does it mean? And in one sense, you could say security just means that we're going to sort of eliminate the possibility of theft. Those are, that's maybe a strongly worded way to phrase it. We want to reduce the possibility of theft if it's property, digital, or physical. Uh, another way to put it is that we want to keep things safe. And in terms of blockchains or distributed systems, safety is a key word. We had two properties of a distributed system, safety and liveness. Uh, and so safety means that nothing bad is necessarily happening that violates the rules of the protocol. So that's where the overlap comes here between security and keeping things safe. Uh, or generally, we want to reduce the risk. Uh, we're not naive enough to say that we can you know, eliminate all the risks entirely. And so we'll do what we can to reduce them. Or what the blockchain security people do is they do a lot of like gaming out scenarios. Say, well, what happens if this information gets leaked? What can possibly be done with it? How can we mitigate against it? Uh, and by going through these scenarios, we can come up with ways to reduce the potential for risk in the future. So we'll recap a few things that we've already looked at before. So if you look at the blockchain tech stack, this is just one way to visualize all the layers in a blockchain network, right? It doesn't all happen at once. We can separate out different layers. And we can start at the bottom here. The physical layer of hardware, or ASICs if you're mining. Don't worry about the numbers right now. But we'll start at the physical layer. And then we've got some network layer a consensus layer to keep everyone in sync, and then some applications on top of that. Now, somewhere in here as well, with the network layer, we have a data layer. Uh, and so, again, this isn't you know, a, a textbook definition of what it looks like. You could insert a data layer here, and the data that we would be talking about would be like the message passing. What are you gonna do with those packets of information? Or if you have to sign a message, what are you gonna do once um, you get that signature out. And so we'll be talking about a few of these in the layered sense, similar to where we get it from the blockchain tech stack. Uh, and I guess the point here of this picture is that we have threats all the way down. So if you can organize it into stacks, that's just like a way of looking at the landscape of threats. And it doesn't matter where you are, there's potential um, for things not to go as planned. Uh, as you can imagine, um, in any system. So I just mentioned two properties about blockchains. Here's a quick recap of that. So a definition of a distributed ledger to you know, maintain state in a permissionless setting. So we need strong civil resistance. And we'll talk about what civil attack is. Proof of work, what they do is through having this scarce resource of clock cycles. And then proof of stake says, well, you have to lock up some stake and vote with your tokens. 
The fork choice rule part here says, how do we decide what happens when the network forks? And there's two properties we want to maintain, liveness and safety. So the safety one here says that nothing bad has happened yet. And by bad, something bad could be like uh, some malicious information gets voted on as the truth. Uh, something bad could be like, rather than uh, adhering to the source of randomness you're supposed to, you can inject your own source of randomness. Uh, so it could be little things like this. Uh, ultimately, at a high level, really something really bad would be a double spend. And that would sort of undermine the whole trust in the network if that happened. Uh, and then the other one, liveness, just says, well, you know, is your network going to stay alive? So for a distributed ledger where we're tacking on blocks, if we're not allowed to put on a new block, then the network can stall. And for you know, all intents and purposes, that's it. The network might die. If in Bitcoin, if your difficulty adjustment gets way out of hand, and it's like orders of magnitude bigger than what your miners are capable of solving, there's a potential that you will not find a block for a very, very, very long time. Uh, and in that case, you know, the network, for all intents and purposes, would be considered dead because your transaction would just be queuing. And it would just be waiting to get updated in the ledger. So these two types of attacks are common in all computing infrastructure. Uh, being as how blockchain is like a subset of all computing infrastructure, they apply as well to blockchains. So the DOS, the denial of service, or a DDoS, a distributed denial of service. The idea here is basically that you're going to ping some resource for information. And doing that uh, by resource, it could, you know, a common example is like a website. You're going to ping a website, and you're going to say, hey, can you return to me this page? Right? So you ask the server to return a page, and the server has to then send you the information for your browser to display. And that takes resources. Most web servers are run in uh, uh, not are run in a distributed manner. So you're paying some cloud hosting provider to be able to handle spikes in traffic, uh, and they're sort of getting pretty good at this. But one of the things they do as a provider is they prevent this idea of a denial of service attack. So what we're after here is to flood the target with traffic. Uh, so it's yeah, just as benign as like, can you return to me you know, the index page of your website? And if you get 10 requests, you can process them sequentially, or maybe you have some parallel processors, and you can handle it quite nicely. None of those users notice the difference. But if you have 10 million requests, then this is where you get the timeout errors when you're trying to browse. And uh, the, the common way around this is to just, from a user's point of view, is to just wait, try again. And from a system's point of view, what you're going to try to do is you're going to try to locate uh, so this one up top is the attacker, okay, attacker machine running client program, and it has a number of other sort of drones or soldiers that are then going to attack the targeted server. So the picture here is of a distributed. Denial of service, the distribution comes from sending out your soldiers to these other machines such that the sysadmin here to block a denial of service is just looking for the IP address of where this traffic request is coming from and running a quick block of that address. Uh, and so if it's only coming from one, that's relatively easy to do. If it's coming from multiple distributed places, it can be harder um, to, to do that. The goal here, right, just exhaust the resources, right, take down the website, meaning that when you do this, it's a form of censorship because if you take down a website or if you take down a block production mechanism in the blockchain, then others that want to push through their transaction are stuck and they can't do it. So it's a form of censorship where the vendor, the blockchain, wants to remain open, right, but their website is not available. Okay, so. The other sort of super common one is called a civil attack, and this is uh, similar, but instead of flooding with traffic, what we're going to do is our single human person here, so this is Jeff, is going to create multiple copies of themselves in this civil nature, such that 
we're going to flood the network with IDs. So the network's going to think that there's multiple people. It's not going to know it's me. It's going to think that there's multiple people that are all at the same time, in this case, uh, voting. Right? We have an election coming up. Online voting is also a, uh, a common topic that people are trying to resolve, possibly with or without blockchain. How can we do you know, serious things like nation state elections uh, in, a in a digital way? Uh, so for example, if it is in a digital way, right? this is a common attack. You have to be sure that one person isn't allowed to copy themselves and vote a lot of times. My noodles up here are because the in practice example of a civil attack is for whatever reason, if you dislike uh, a restaurant, uh, you can create you know, multiple accounts, and you can feed the restaurant bad reviews. And the online review nature of restaurants is such that they're extremely important for restaurants and um, businesses to get new clients. Uh, and you know, bad reviews can absolutely torch uh, your business, especially if you've got like tourists that are only in town for a day, and they're looking for things to do, places to eat, and they see bad reviews. Uh, and so that's a whole other area is um, you know, uh, coordinated attacks in a civil nature to give bad reviews. And maybe uh, a similar example might be like you see a really good deal and you want to get that $20 off or you want to get that one month free for the streaming service. And so you get everyone in your family to either sign up all at once and collect the rewards or you just sequentially game the system by always uh, after your trial expires, getting a new trial. So that's you know another form of uh, civil attacks. Uh, so you know what are we going to do about this? Uh, we need strong civil resistance. We don't want people to do this in blockchains. And so we have two solutions. Maybe I'll go back to this one. The solution for proof of work cryptocurrencies is that if you split up your computing power you only get proportional rewards. So there's nothing to gain by doing that. So you can split it as many times as you want. You can pretend to be 100 million miners uh, as opposed to just one miner. But those 100 millions are only going to get their proportional reward. So if the system works as intended, you don't get any extra reward by doing this. And therefore, people don't bother. You might, I don't know, you might have some distributed nature. You might have. Uh, you might want to have multiple accounts or multiple keys for various purposes, but you're not trying to get extra awards in a civil manner. Uh, in the proof of stake system, to prevent this from happening, what you're going to do is you're going to get people to bond their stake. So you have to submit a certain amount of tokens, which you know presumably map to real world value, and you have to lock them up. So if I want to create 100 million validators in Ethereum, that's cool, but each one of those needs 32 ETH. And as far as we know, there's no way to game that uh, in terms of being able to uh, make it look like all of them have the minimum required stake. Uh, so the penalties here are such that you just waste electricity and you have to pay for it in proof of work. And the penalty in proof of stake is called slashing, and this is where you lose some of your stake, or you know, potentially all of your stake, if you're really not playing by by the rules, and so um, you know, you've got that's going to hit you right in the pocket. Okay, de denial of service attacks. Uh, the way that we're going to handle this, you know, this isn't as important in blockchains because of the distributed nature. So, if you are already distributed in your network, denial of service is not that important. So if we think about taking down you know, a, a website, or if you have attackers looking to take down like the state, vote, state election site, that site is located in one, one spot, central place. And you could probably, if you're clever, find out where that is. In a distributed system, that's fine. If you want to take down my node, everybody directs traffic at it to eat up resources. That's fine, because there's other nodes that pick up the slack and process transactions. So it may affect me personally, but because of the distributed nature of a blockchain, uh, you know, the more distributed, the better, and this is not going to be a problem. So that one uh, essentially takes care of itself, and then the incentive mechanisms should also take care of the civil attacks. So 
So historical footnote here, Sybil is named after a character in a book. Uh, and the, the main character in the book, her name was Sybil, and she had multiple personalities uh, as a consequence of uh, childhood abuse. I'm just reciting here uh, bits from Wikipedia. I haven't, haven't read the book. Um, but that's where the idea comes from, is that one person can create multiple copies of themselves. Looking at some of the specific things that we can do, if we're looking to monopolize a resource, not necessarily in the way that we're flooding or that we're uh, monopolizing traffic in a website. But if we think about block space, right, blockchains, the idea is that you provide a fee auction for block space. And that once you're in the block, then others can audit the block. It's publicly visible. And you can do things with this, like keep track of value or you know, post up certificates, uh, post up hashes, things like this. So that's the idea of like the, the public resource, the public infrastructure. So what can you do if you're trying to attack that? Well, you could try to spam the network. So you could try to outbid everyone else so that only your blocks are getting through. Um, and you know the miners don't care about this because they're still making the fees and they're still earning the block rewards. And uh, essentially, this, this doesn't matter, right? It's kind of like advertising. Uh, the big events are going to go to the highest bidder. If you want to advertise uh, you know, at the Super Bowl, right, uh, you're going to have to outbid the other major corporations that are also doing that as well. But if that keeps up for a long, long time, then you know, the network is no longer open and public. Um, so we get this idea where we price people out. If the transaction fees are consistently high, we've seen this with Ethereum in the past, then people get grumpy. If you want to swap a token on Uniswap and it costs you $25, $35, $45, dollars, right? That is not a nice user experience. Um, you know, where are those fees going? They're just going to the validators. They're just going to the miners. Um, so that's not a nice experience. And eventually, people will leave and vote with their feet. So you need to keep this in control, or the incentive mechanism should be aligned to keep this in control. Another potential style of attack uh, in a proof of work system is that you could just be mining empty blocks. So maybe if you are a large pool operator, what you're doing is looking for hashes, but at the same time, you're coordinating what goes into the block. And so maybe you just don't put anything in the block. You find the hash and you post it. Find another hash and you post it. So empty blocks, you know, that's also not helping the network as a whole. And this is a form of censorship whereby you're waiting for your transaction to get in, but that pool miner isn't letting me in because they're mining empty blocks. And you know, they're taking a hit. They're taking a loss there if they're not earning transaction fees. Uh, in terms of trying to overwhelm specific nodes, uh, if you can identify nodes or locations, um, then you can, you, know, you can send invalid transactions. You can send invalid blocks such that the validators are processing this information, and that's eating up resources on their end. So you know, this is kind of like. Uh, it's not very nice behavior, you know, uh, blockchain etiquette or uh, validator etiquette. You know, don't send invalid transactions. Uh, so civil attacks, we talked about those. So both of those kind of map into the blockchain space. Uh, now we'll look at a few attacks that are sort of blockchain only. So the 51% attack basically is a double spend attack. Why would you want 51%? Well, if you have the majority of the hash power, then you can start to guide consensus. You're going to find a little bit more blocks than the other person. right? If you have 99% of the hash power, you're going to find 99 out of 100 blocks over the long run. If you have 51%, you just have a slight edge. And you could use that slight edge for things like censorship, like we just mentioned, um, for things like uh, empty or empty-ish blocks. Uh, and if you can keep this up and manage it for a while, you might be able to execute a double spend. And so 51% and double spend are related. Of course, I think I mentioned at the beginning, if you can double spend, that kind of invalidates the whole network, like immediately. If news comes out tomorrow that somebody double spends on Bitcoin, there's going to be a massive rush for the exits. Get my money out, cash out, swap tokens, do whatever you can, right? And it, it would be it would be absurd panic. Um, there are some people that think that it wouldn't kill Bitcoin. It would just really harm 
uh, you know, and we could sort of recover from it. There are methods that you could do to recover from something like this. Um, but recovery is all subjective. It's all about the users and the trust in the network. So double spend is really like a, that, that's your deal breaker where uh, you're like, sorry, I got to exit this relationship. It's uh, not working for me. Okay, so I'll let this guy ask his question, short clip. Just, uh, just a quick follow up on that. Um, do you have any concerns about a large nation state that has um, interest in just actively destroying Bitcoin to make their own you know, super rates and uh, design chips and just throw hundreds of millions or billions of dollars to intentionally disrupt the blockchain? Yeah, I, I don't worry about that at all. Um, this cannot be done with Bitcoin anymore. This is something that can only be done with nascent altcoins. Uh, Bitcoin has achieved a, a level of computing that uh, no single nation state can uh, can overthrow it through computation alone. Uh, the effort to do so would require a massive covert operation of chip fabrication, uh, then the coordinated assault that would give them dominance over the next block for 10 minutes until we kick those bastards off the network, uh, rework the protocol around them, they would be revealed, they would have lost a billion dollars doing this, and all they got to do was run double spend. Now, here's the thing. Long before we get to that point, they figure out that if they just let this stuff run, they can actually get some Bitcoin as a reward, because the incentive structure actually works. And so I'm not worried about that. And a lot of people are watching the blockchain. And as I said before, what are they going to do? So they take over, and they fork the blockchain, and they go somewhere. Right? They've created an alternative blockchain. Great. What are we going to do? Who's going to join the NSA blockchain? <laughs> Anybody want to jump on Fedcoin? <laughs> so we're all going to stay on the old fork. Difficulty will go down. It will get more profitable for the miners who stayed behind. And we'll carry on with our coin, and they can go mine whatever the hell they want on their alternative blockchain. They achieve nothing. They can't make protocol changes because we, as I said, five constituencies in consensus, and it would take a billion dollars to pull the most ridiculous Keystone cops failure in history. <laughs> Plus, this would actually require government that can do IT. <laughs> nice, nice little uh, rib at the end there about governments doing IT. All right, so I mean, he, he's he's snarky, right? But it's because he's confident. Uh, it's because you know he's done the homework. Uh, this was in 2014, 2015. So you know, eight years on, uh, it still it still stands. So if you look at the hash power of Bitcoin's network as a total, it's kind of continued to only go up. And so 51%. I mean, that in theory still applies. But one of the things to consider is how are you going to get 51%? of the hash power of the network to start guiding consensus just so that you can either censor or double spend, like Andreas just said. And if you do such a thing, right, you can't guarantee participation will be the same as it is presently. Uh, so I guess we could still say that this is an experiment waiting to be played out, although we would have said the same thing back uh, when Andreas was doing this in 2014. Uh, and, and here we are, hash power has only grown. Uh, and we've talked about mining pools and the potential decentralization risk that mining pools bring. So I mean, that is uh, still a threat in terms of the decentralized nature here. Um, one more thing to consider on this point is that if you want to get 51% of the hash power, you can't just take 51% of what's available right now because all of that hash power is out earning money for people. It's part of businesses, it's a part of you know, hobbyists mining at home and running shipping containers and doing all sorts of things. So logistically, it'd be extremely difficult to acquire that. If you wanted to do your own, you'd have to do it in secret. You'd have to, you know, I think Andreas mentioned, you have to acquire like a chip fab to start building chips or like be able to hire a chip company to build them for you. Yeah, you'd have to you know, produce the hardware. And then if, if, if this is the total hash power, what you'd have to do if you're bringing new hash power online is consider 50% of the new total. So it's not 50% of today's total, because if you add 50%, that's only 
that's only one third that you've got. And so it escalates from there. So there's a dynamic nature at play as more hash power comes online. There's the fact of like, um, you can't just you know go down to, where do you buy your computers? You can't go down to PB Tech, right? And say, I need 51% of the hash power for this network and they'll give it to you. There are places online where you can rent it, um, but even that is not going to provide you anywhere near what you need. So here's a chart produced by this website saying if you want to execute an attack, how much hash rate do you need? Uh, so right at the top, so I, I think this is up to date, but I'm not sure if they've updated sort of this in the background. So what's the, what the, this is saying, 418 petahashes, and the cost to attack is over a million dollars per hour, but that's only if you can get the hash power and so here's an example from this company, Nice Hash, where you can rent hash power. Let's do a quick search. See if they are still in business. Uh, hash power buying, live marketplace pricing. Okay, so there is a marketplace here, so you can you know put in some bids and NiceHash then has access to miners that they will run for you. Anyways, in terms of that one place, they, they don't have even, uh, I guess it rounds down to zero. They don't have even 1% of the hash power required. But if you look at some of these other coins, let's look at, we need 51%, right? Dun, 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 dun. Here we go. Raven coin, market cap almost 200 million. For $2,000, you can attack the network for an hour. So I mean, that's sort of like, that's within maybe budget of like a research group, for example. Uh, and if that's you know still too expensive, go down here to Flux. I've never heard of Flux. I don't, at least I don't think I have. $300 for an hour to attack uh, the Flux network. And so you can you know run some experiments. In, in this manner to try to guide consensus. So like I mentioned, these are all dynamic in nature uh, and you know, at any given time you're fighting or you're going against like electricity prices, you're going against like supply chains, you're going against like um, the unknowns, which is that if you get a significant portion of hash power, other people might plug in miners that are offline that maybe weren't profitable uh, to try to dilute, the, you know, there's lots of different ways that it could play out. And so it really is, you know, a beautiful experiment to try to see how all of this will go. Uh, even coins like Bitcoin Cash and Ethereum Classic, right, these are both forks, uh, are very, very hard to attack in a double span manner by getting 51% or to attack in a 51% manner. Okay, one more piece here on proof of work. So when you like do your Google, what are some Bitcoin or what are some blockchain attacks? Selfish mining comes up. So let's run through what selfish mining is. There's, I put a link in the notes. There's a nice blog post here, not too detailed, where I got these diagrams from. Um, by a academic about what selfish mining is. So here's what we're gonna do. Black is main chain, okay. Uh, dashed red is my chain and I'm not gonna publish my block. So the reason why you always publish immediately is because you wanna win the race. You don't win the race by hashing in your garage. You win the race by telling everyone else that you found the target, right? It's like posting up that cool photo on Instagram. It doesn't matter if you have it, right? It matters that everyone can see that you have it, something like this. So you wanna flood the network as soon as possible in order to earn the reward. So why would you wanna keep it to yourself? So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna keep mining and because of the probabilistic nature of mining, eventually we're going to have a situation where a few blocks ahead of the public chain, a few blocks ahead in secret. So we're here we're three blocks ahead so the strategy says, if you're ahead, you're gonna wait until the main chain is one block behind 
So now we've got one, two blocks here, and this fork is three blocks deep. And then the solid line here is when you publish it, and I wrote down that's the surprise. You're gonna say, oh, by the way, I've got three blocks that instantly make your fork of two blocks invalid because mine is longer, right? This one is two, this one is three, three bigger than two. Now, when you do this, other miners are gonna come tag along to you because you're the longest chain. And so where's the reward here? Well, you get now a th from these three blocks, you get your block reward. But what happens is that these two blocks here on the original chain or the previous fork are now invalid or they're orphaned and those miners do not get that reward. So it's like a zero sum game here. So instead of you earning more, what you're doing is out of the total rewards, you're making somebody else earn less. So, you know, long-term play, if everybody else is learning much, earning much, much less, then you overall are getting more blocks and more reward. So maybe we could do a pen here, so these guys now get no reward. These are orphans. All right, and if those are your competitors, now they've wasted their hash power. Okay, so how does, how does this look? How much hash do we need in our chain to do this? And so the red line is the selfish mining, and you can see here it's below the gray line, so you're losing money. 10%, 20%, 25%, you're losing money. But past a third, so this is about 33% here, past a third of the hash power, and you're more profitable than the gray line, which are people being honest. So revenue here, 40% of the reward. If you have 40% of the hash power, but the selfish miner can earn 40, can earn 50% of, so you know, the, the delta there is plus 10%. Now these are really large numbers, right, for Bitcoin. And so we, we don't see selfish mining in practice, but that doesn't mean that pools can't come together and sort of implement this strategy, play around with it, try it out. So selfish mining has been around for a long time. And since about 2014, I think the paper came out and a lot of work has been done, you know, looking at it and analyzing it and figuring out the intricacies um, but Bitcoin is so big that we essentially do not see any selfish mining. But, you know, it's kind of like there in the background just waiting either for another chain uh, or waiting for the right moment. Moving on here to proof of stake. So when I've got stake in the title, this refers to proof of stake. So if we look at a few of the attacks that can be had on a proof of stake system. So we're thinking now Ethereum or Ethereum post-merge proof of stake version of Ethereum. So again, just to highlight some of the ones that you'll see when you look this up, some of the names. Stake grinding attack. So grinding refers to the fact that you're just gonna be toiling away in the background until you gain an advantage. So the idea of a proof of work miner is that they're grinding the whole time. And they're grinding out in the open and they're gonna try to race for that reward. In proof of stake, if you're grinding in the background, you're doing some pre-computation to try to gain an advantage. So sometimes this is called uh, some, something like uh, pre-computation attacks where, for example, if you know that some piece of randomness or some part of the protocol depends on some information, you can off to the side in parallel be trying to use that to your advantage and then when required, you know, post or use that to post to the main chain. So for example here, a case study from Next, NXT. So in Next, the future block at plus one depended on the proposer of the current block. So if I was the current block and I proposed it, then like take my ID or my name and use that as part of the input to choose the next block. So you could like hash up my name or my validator ID as part of the input to find 
block i plus one. So the theory is that you have to wait for the present block before you look for the future block. Uh, but if you know this, what you could do, for example, is as soon as you find a block, if I'm block i, what I could do is then I, I could use that information now to start looking for i plus one while everybody else is still looking for block i. And then I could do this you know, off to the side in parallel. Uh, and there is kind of a loop that I could get into where I could get blocks and blocks and blocks ahead just using my own information in order to find future blocks. And uh, so, you know, th th that's a bit of a problem. So state grinding attacks, we're gonna use some information to our advantage, and we're basically gonna compute in parallel off to the side. The way around this, down here I've written strong randomness. So usually it's about a piece of randomness that isn't as random as we want it to be. And so I got this image from ETH2 book about Ethereum's implementation. So they use RANDAP, RAN DAO. So DAO is like the decentralized organization and then RAN for random. So if all of us in this room have our own bit of randomness, what we're gonna do is combine them together and that's gonna form the random DAO. So we see here the analogy, it's like shuffling cards and then you pass the cards to the next person and they shuffle the deck. So somebody might be bad at shuffling, right? You, uh, you know, dealers at the casino are quite good at managing, managing the cards. If you haven't played cards though, shuffling can be kind of a tricky task. So that person that hasn't played cards has weak randomness in mixing up and shuffling the deck. But it's okay if I have weak randomness because the next person overall has strong randomness and combined we can get uh, a strong random value. So everybody contributes to the Randau in Ethereum and the source of entropy here, we're gonna take something that everybody wants to keep secret because we don't want them to leak it. And so we're gonna take everybody's private keys as part of their source of entropy. So again, you're not gonna pass out your private keys and be like, there's my random bit. But um, you can pass your private keys through uh, a function and then contribute to randomness as well. So state grinding attacks, usually looking for some exploitation of randomness and the way around it is just better randomness. And uh, Randau in Ethereum gets quite complex. Uh, there's, there's a lot more to it. Um, this is you know, a problem in proof of stake. How do we randomly pick the next person without anyone gaining an advantage? The nothing at stake attack here at the setup can be introduced comparing it to Bitcoin. So in Bitcoin, you have to pay for the electricity to produce the hashes, and that's your, that's your stake, it's built in. In proof of stake, if the chain forks, so back to proof of work, let's finish that thought. Um, when there's a fork, you have to split your hash power and choose which one to mine on. So you wanna choose wisely so that you have the highest chance of earning a reward. So you wanna choose which fork to mine, right? You have scarce hash power. And proof of stake, when the network forks, we have equal copies of stake on both forks. And so there's not really any incentive to choose wisely. Uh, in fact, the incentive is to then contribute to both forks, and if it forks again, and if it forks again, the incentive is just to contribute to every fork to try to collect as much of the rewards as possible. So there's not really a, a good incentive here to choose wisely in proof of stake. So this is what is meant by having nothing at stake. You're not gonna lose that electricity for com competing on the wrong fork. So the solution here is pretty simple, uh, and it's that what you're gonna do is you're gonna make people lock up their stake, and then you're gonna take some of it, some of it away. And it's not like, uh, you know, it's part of the protocol. You sign up for these rules, so you're in agreement in the beginning that if you start building on a fork, then your stake is gonna get slashed. And the slashing rewards can be quite strict or can be quite enforced quite heavily in Ethereum. And of course, it's tens of thousands of dollars for a validator, uh, so you don't wanna do, you don't want to, yeah, build on too many forks.
Okay, one more style of attack for a staking system or for Ethereum. So a long range attack is this idea that you could have a subset of validators go back to the beginning and build up their own chain. Uh, and then once they build up to public Ethereum chain tip, they convince other people to build on their chain and then their chain is you know, the new canon canonical version. Uh, so very, very long range if your blockchain's been around many years, going back to the beginning and building all the way up. So a little bit of the theory of how, how this looks and what we do about it. Uh, so I borrowed this slide from this presentation here by A16Z Crypto researcher Lyra. And the window here shows us that in green, this is the only time you're earning a reward is in green when you're actually validating. But in order to get there, you have to like, you know, get in the queue and you have to, you know, do your paperwork, sign some forms. So first of all, you need the assets, right? And then you need to submit them and you get staking keys. And we need staking keys because you are at risk of your reward getting slashed. And if the protocol doesn't have your keys, they can't take your funds away. Uh, and then, you know, we're back to the nothing at stake problem. So we've got some keys here, and then we have a smaller validator window. The next problem is that we need people to be able to leave. So let's say you're done with Ethereum, or let's say you, know, you wanna buy something with that stake that you had in Ethereum, you're cashing out. So you need to be able to leave the protocol, and also part of a you know, decentralized permissionless protocol is that you're allowed to leave. So upon exit, what we're gonna do is we're gonna make you wait before you're unstaked and before you can go to the exchange and cash out. And the reason we're gonna make you wait is once you're gone, there's no incentives for you to keep those old keys safe. So you got some staking keys when you signed up. There's no incentive now going forward in time to keep those keys safe. So what could you do? Well, you know, in theory, old keys can be sold to corrupt validators, or old keys can be posted in some forum or can be you know, presented to a researcher. People could maybe collect a bunch of old keys, get together a set of validators, and then do the long range attack from the beginning. So four can catch up. So the picture here says we have a malicious validator. These are sets of validators. So you know, there's you know, six in the picture. At this stage, the malicious, val malicious validators decide to fork the protocol and build on the prior block. So we're down here. They're building up on their own using old keys. So even though they're behind the present time, they can build up faster than the real network and catch up. And then the problem here is that this dude isn't sure. I just came in, I just woke up. I'm not sure which is the real chain. It looks like they're both valid. And as it says here, unless they've been following all the consensus rounds actively, there's a chance that you could build on the wrong chain. So the primary way to mitigate this potential is to implement some checkpoints such that past a certain point, past a certain block number, all right, you're not allowed to go back and fork. And if you do, everyone's gonna be notified that that is an invalid branch. So checkpointing, uh, and checkpointing is used uh, every two epics in Ethereum. So I don't know if that's six or 12 minutes. Um, there's checkpoints that everybody votes on and that sort of finalizes the chain prior to that history. But a few other solutions here are that you can have people rotate their keys. So if you're gonna have your old keys get compromised, the way around that is to say, well, those old keys are out of date anyway, so I don't care if they're compromised. And there's a problem though of how do you enforce that someone actually deleted their keys when the keys got rotated. The other thing, uh, another thing that is done is you're required to stay online for a long time. So if everybody's awake, awake online the whole time, then you're watching consensus and you're not going to sort of wake up after a long sleep and join the wrong chain accidentally. So you just have to follow along the whole time. So by following along your clients, 
are voting the whole time on the right chain, and you're not getting slashed. Uh, mitigation number four are these finality gadgets. These are like your checkpoints that says that after a certain while, we're not going to accept any changes at all to the chain. And it's fine uh, because everyone's agreeing to these rules in advance. Uh, and then Lara and her group here produced, uh, came up with uh, a Winkle, this method called Winkle. And what they're proposing with their research is that in a transaction, you just have like two from amount sort of fields. So they're proposing that also a blockchain should be built in a transaction, everybody votes on the state of the chain. So you have 100 coins to Jeff. Where it's coming from, I guess from, from my own node. And then also at the same time, you're going to vote on the chain tip. And so if you do this, you can sort of collate all the votes from all the transactions uh, as the transactions are being processed. Uh, and that's going to sort of make any old branches stale as these transactions come in. So that's kind of like a, a proposal about how to do it. I guess one of the uh, takeaways here is that, you know, out of these five mitigations, there's not like really a super easy way to solve this problem. Um, and the hope is that if we add them all together, layer them on top of each other, we'll have sort of uh, enough of a defense that the blockchain can, you know, maintain safety. OK, so outside of the specific technical blockchain attacks, uh, in the notes, I've mentioned a few more, sort of some with explanation, some without as like names of potential attacks. But I think those are the main ones that you come across. Definitely 51% double spending, uh, nothing at stake, uh, grinding and long range type of attacks. But those are sort of all attacks on the protocol, right? Those are all attacks on the consensus mechanism. And as these are open systems, you're free to go experiment and try out these attacks and see how they go. Uh, and you know, it's not illegal to, you know, there's, there's no criminal law saying that you can't do this. Um, transitioning more into the social side, I've just, I just wrote up a list here of things I, I thought of at the time here, and I've called it personal security. So, in terms of like personal OPSEC, operational security with keeping your things safe, really you, you want to protect your keys as much as possible. Your keys are your lifeline to the asset, to being able to move it around, to do things with it on, the, on chain. Uh, so hardware wallets, um, which Guy mentioned in his guest lecture when he came, uh, hardware wallets, you know, they store the key to sign messages offline only in hardware as opposed to being online in your, browser, uh, in your browser extension, something like that. Rotating your keys, right? This is just good practice. After a while, um, send your assets to uh, a new account such that you know that you're still in control. Uh, and then you can forget about any potential breaches of past keys. We should be wary of key generation as well. This has to do with randomness. So if you're not using a good random number generator, uh, and we have seen examples of this in the wild where um, keys have been compromised because people used a service that didn't have the best random number generation practices in place. Further to this, if you have large assets or you're running a business, you definitely want multi-sig. You don't want to be the headline news of that one exchange. Uh, you don't want to be Gerald Cotton, who was the exchange CEO of Quadriga, a Canadian exchange back in 2015, 2016, Gerald and his wife went on honeymoon in India. He was the CEO of the exchange, uh, and he had a heart attack in India and died, and he took those keys to his death, apparently. Uh, there is a, a popular podcast about this whole story. It's pretty, it's crazier than it sounds. Um, so you don't want to be that guy running a business, you know, uh, trying to do some good in the world. Perhaps we don't know about Gerald's intentions. You don't want to take your keys to your death. Use multi-sig. Diversify, right? Don't put all your coins in one account or in one wallet or in one web browser, right? Spread the risk around. 
check your URLs. This is exactly the same thing that like gets in your inbox all the time with the phishing attempts, right? Check your URLs, check the lock on the URLs. Don't click reply links in emails. Uh, disable browser extensions. So if you're running MetaMask when you're done, right? Turn off MetaMask so it's not running in the background. Who knows what future vulnerabilities could appear from things like this. Uh, disable SIM card two-factor authentication from all of your services that you're using. So just like, it's a long list, but once you sort of make a habit of it, you just do these things automatically and you'll be, you'll be much better off in the long run. But again, these aren't like, these aren't about like breaking the protocol in the blockchain. This is more about like social engineering and ways that you can slip up. But it's not just people, right? It can be businesses as well that do this. Next up, what's on the horizon? We've got digital assets or DeFi coming up next week. After that, we have a Metaverse and Web3 guest lecture, so that'll be in two weeks. And then our final lecture I have listed as social factors, so I'm not quite sure what we'll do in lecture 12, but it's still on the horizon.